Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for our second session in our Women's in History Month series. Uh, I'd like to start by uh, introducing our um, guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Marvia Jones, who is the first um, Black and the first female uh, director of the Kansas City Health Department. Uh, Dr. Jones has been working in the field of public health for 15 years with a special interest in violence prevention and health policy, both of which were honed during her time at the Federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. While at the CDC, she evaluated the effectiveness of prevention tools provided to state and local health departments. In the policy office, she developed recommendations for public health best practices, such as the credentialing of community health workers. Um, before joining the Kansas City Health Department in 2019, Dr. Jones directed programs, policy development, and evaluation at communities creating opportunities. Originally from Florida, Dr. Jones has been living in Kansas City for 12 years, except for the two years she spent in Atlanta completing her CDC fellowship. Uh, we are very, very lucky and honored to have her today. Um, welcome, Dr. Jones. Thank you, Dr. Jamal. It's an honor to be here. And I want to thank everyone, uh, the folks who invited me. Thank you. I'm grateful to Swope Health for this opportunity to come before you today. Um, I also want to thank um, all of the community people partners who have reached out to me to show support um, and to provide any encouragement uh, for me. And I just really appreciate that. And it does mean a lot to me. Um, I'm going to share a few slides uh, with you today. Don't worry, they're not long. So you can uh, watch this while you enjoy your lunch. Uh, okay, it seems to be working well. So it should, should. All right, all right. So I was asked today to talk about, um, and I'm going to change my display settings. I'm sorry, just, um, I was asked to talk today just about um, a little bit about my path as well as what things I recommend for other folks um, who are in the space of leadership, uh, particularly women in leadership and when we're thinking about community and health work. Um, my very, I'll tell you, I'm a huge fan of Brene Brown uh, and all of the work that she has done around vulnerability. I do believe that um, by us being able to show up and show up as who we are and be in a space and just be completely open, uh, it, it does unlock like a secret. I will never forget. Um, I was here at the health department and I had kind of been promoted into leading a large team uh, at the department and had never really managed that many people before. Um, I didn't really know a lot of the people on that team because I had been mostly doing kind of my own work uh, since I've been here. And I remember going into, coming into that role and, you know, we're all so professional, you know, we, we go to school, we, we've and so we did our internships and we're taught, you know, you show up, you, you know, you get your, I got my collar, you know, I've got my, my jacket straight. I'm professional. I'm wearing my professional attire. And, you know, I, I want to know what are our metrics and what are our performance measures and where are we um, with all of our stuff and how are we looking and, and are we all at one point, you know, we all want to be one point, right? That's how we're taught. Um, particularly as women, we want to show up and we want to show up well, right? We're, that's what we do. And I will never forget <laughs> showing up that way in the beginning to that team and just the kind of the, the reaction I got, right? So some people, you'll meet those people who are like, okay, I'm here to support the leader, whoever you are. And then you run into people who are like, I don't know you. <laughs> I don't know you. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you came from and why you're here. Uh, and, and until you answer these questions for me, I won't be able to follow you. We have people like that in our organizations. All of us do. And we have to acknowledge that. And so I will never forget how um, after kind of trading water, talking to these different folks, telling them what we need to do and these metrics and 
how I'm not happy with where we are in certain aspects of our work, I will never forget um, the conversation I had with myself <laughs> after kind of, let's say probably, I don't know, maybe three to four weeks of that type of behavior. And I had a conversation where I said, Marvia, you know all the information, you, your background is in psychology. You know the old adage about how people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care and why you care. Um, so go back to your why. Um, someone I used to know who's moved away, Seth Hunter, some of you, Dr. Hunter, some of you might have known. He told me that several years ago. Um, and I had to bring that back. And so what I did, um, I did have to go back to who I was, why I'm so passionate about this work, and why I care so much, and how do I bring people along with me. And, and so, he, again, we're at a health department. And so I started at our division meeting. Um, I brought some slides. You know, I had some pictures from where I used to grow up. I had um, some pictures of my family. Um, and I start, I had sort of a, okay, I'm going to talk to them about why healthy homes is important, right? Because we do healthy homes inspections here at the health department. Um, I'm going to talk to them about why it's important to take care of families, young families, and how at risk they are and why I'm so passionate about that. And what I did in that moment, the way that my spirit led me in that moment when I talked to my team that morning, I had the slides of my family and I was just going to be like, hey, this is, you know, this is my family. I care about other children, yada, yada, yada. But where I was guided in that moment was to really tell them why I care. You see, I know what it is like to come from a family that is vulnerable. I know what it is like to be the daughter of teenagers who don't know what's going on. I know what it's like to not have much because they are two really kids trying to figure life out. And I said, that's who's walking through our door every day. That when we immunize them, we provide their childhood immunizations. We're dealing with that child, but we're dealing with also families, young, their parents sometimes who may not know what's going on. They're just trying to figure it out. So we provide the best care to them that we can. But I also talked to him about the houses, the housing that I um, came from and why a program like this would have been so important to my family. And then I went to a very vulnerable place and talked to them about why the violence prevention work was so important to me and why the work around teen suicide prevention and youth suicide prevention was so important to me. And surprisingly, I shared to them how there was a time uh, as a young teenager where living with the turmoil that we were dealing with, there was a point where I could have used the program that helped encourage me um, against uh, having suicidal ideation, even as a young person. Um, and so there's in, the, in that type of moment, always this tension of, okay, if, if I lay myself bare, um, how will people respect me as a leader? If I lay myself bare in this way, will people use it? Will somehow this be used against me, right? There's always that voice going on. But I will never forget the response um, that I received. And that response was like, first people were shocked. <laughs> I think people, were, I mean, I literally saw mouths open on a little Teams camera because we were meeting on Teams. Like this person who is, Dr. Jones, you know, has always just been Dr. Jones to us, you know, has talked to us about not just why she's so passionate about the work, but she has laid bare her soul to us as to why um, this matters so much to her and the people that we serve in our community. And so, um, I mean, I just got so many emails and so many people stopping by my office saying, hey, thank you for that. You helped me relearn why I'm here. And so those are some of the most powerful responses I got. And so I really think that that was the day unintentionally that I really earned. Um, I think that's the day I became the leader of my team. And I, I don't want to be flippant or weird. Um, I think that is really the day because I think people really want to know that this is not about you. It's not about us as individual people and our title and our status and our salaries and our uh, a claim. It's not about that. People want to know that we really care about the work and why we care. 
Um, and so I really want to, to just start with that because Brene Brown talks a lot about getting into the arena. And I really love it. I, I do recommend you check that out. She has a wonderful TED talk on vulnerability. That's B R E Brown for those of you who haven't looked her up. But she has a wonderful talk, a series of, of talks. Um, her TED talk has been watched millions of times. But she has this wonderful talk where she quotes back to a former president um, who talks about how it's easy for people to kind of sit on the sidelines um, and talk about what should be going on, what should be done, um, what, what people are missing, where people are going wrong, what people should do if they knew better. But it's another thing to step into the arena. And I included this image, this poor resolution image of the arena, because I want you to kind of get the imagery behind that. So y'all, a lot of us have seen Gladiator um, came out a long time ago with um, Russell Crowe and people, and he's, you know, being forced to fight as a gladiator. But I wanted, I, I think the image of what the arena, when we talk about getting to the arena, you know, we might think about like um, uh, Arrow, Arrowhead or whatever it's called now, the stadium for the Chiefs and all of that. We think about that. That's an arena. But I also love this image of this sort of old school um, historical uh, where the, the folks would get in and have to fight and defend their lives or whatever, often under terrible circumstances. They, they didn't really choose to go into the arena. They were usually forced into that. And you, to think of all the eyes that are on you and to think of having to come out of a little tunnel or you come out of one end of the tunnel and not knowing what's going to come out that other end. It could be some huge lion or it could be another fighter um, who's got more weapons than you or whatever coming out. You, you not knowing, but just there in the middle of the arena and watching to and, and, and having to say, embrace yourself. I have to deal what's going to come out with whatever comes out of here in front of all these people. And so I want us to think about, um, I don't know why I'm getting emotional today. <laughs> I want us to think about how when we step into a space of leadership, that is what so many of us are doing. If you don't get that, if you don't feel like you are standing there embracing yourself and going to fight with all that you have, not knowing exactly what's coming out of the other end, you may not be fully stepping into the arena. You know, um, I think sometimes we have to examine, are we in the arena or are we on the sideline commenting on the people who are in the arena? Because there is a difference. Um, and until you have stood in the middle of this <laughs> space, you, until you've stood on the 50 yard line in the middle of the stadium, or you've stood here in the middle, it's hard for you to fully grasp what that can mean for people. And so it's hard for you. I would, uh, I would recommend that we monitor our criticism of the people who are in the arena. It's not that we won't face it once we're in there, but it is there. Brené Brown does a great job of talking about how it's one thing to be in the stands and another thing to be there. And so um, I would just say um, I have learned that we have to step into the arena and there's so much fear associated with that. All these eyes on me, what are the eyes going to, if I walk wrong in my heels, they're going to see that. If I say the wrong thing, if I make a decision that maybe they don't understand why I made it because they're not in the middle of the arena, I'm in the middle of it, but they're on the stands and they don't agree with the decision I made. Um, these are all normal fears that we have. And so I just bring those up to say that I have learned to embrace those and I'm continuing to learn to embrace those further. That's kind of the first step. And then the next piece is to show up fully within the arena, you know, and what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that sometimes when we show up as leaders, you know, and I, I'm going to speak from the perspective as a, a woman, sometimes we have been so um, groomed to be so uh, cultured and so tailored to where we forget who we even are and why our specific selves, why we have been brought to where we are and what we have to offer that's different than what the status quo would have offered. And what, you know, so what am I saying? What I'm saying is that sometimes we can hinder um, ourselves and we can also hinder the space that we're stepping into when we don't fully show up. So 
Um, for instance, um, if we believe that we have to, you know, act as a man would in a situation, I have to be aloof, I need to be stoic, I need to be emotionless, I need to be removed. Um, <laughs> sometimes that's how some of our organizations got into the mess there. <laughs> um, because if we're thinking that we have to show up in a stereotypical way that does not really fit us. Now, if you are a stoic person, if you are a reserved person, then be that. That's who you are. But we do have to kind of check ourselves. I'm learning um, to check myself as, am I showing up as Marvia? Um, the Marvia who grew up on the street in Florida and, and who saw what was around me? Or am I showing up as Dr. Marvia Jones, who has, you know, worked at CDC and, and, you know, finds herself in a leadership position in a, in an organization is, is, am I showing up as my full self? Um, and all of these are aspects of our role. So we, we are professionals, we are mothers, we are partners, we community members, we're neighbors, we're sisters, we're friends, we're all these things. Um, but sometimes we devalue those parts of us that we don't feel are welcome. And so I want to say to us all, part of showing up in that arena is, is to show up fully and bring all of those pieces with you. Because but when you bring your pieces, you unlock that ability for others to do the same thing. And when we don't do that, we are hindering ourselves, but also not letting someone else excel because they don't feel safe either. So that's something that I'm continuing to learn. And then bring all of your gear to the arena, right? You know, we think, you know, okay, I bring my power suit, I bring my, my credentials, I bring all of that. But I, so I want us to think a little bit differently about that because I've had to, do, to think differently about that. I also have to bring my creativity. I have to bring the scrappiness that helped me, um, allowed me to go to school, go in high school and then stay up late and figure out how to get all my homework and my papers done in a household that maybe wasn't able to support my academic success. Those skills that I honed there, I, that has served me well in my career. But sometimes we show up and we, again, leave part of ourselves there. Hey, I'm a creative person. I like to have fun at work. I like to connect with people. Um, my strength is connectivity or connectedness with others. So know what your strengths are. I highly recommend um, the book called Strength Finder. I just gave a copy to someone this morning in a one-on-one, -on -one and I wish I had an image with me, but it's through Gallup. So if you look up Gallup, G-A-L-L-U-P, uh, you'll see Strength Finder. I recommend that you take the assessment that's there so that you know what your strengths are. My top two strengths are empathy and connectedness. Well, some people might say, or they might have said 10 years ago, Where's your strategy? Where's your strategic planning and your, you know, I need you, you need that command strength, the strength to take charge of a situation and all of that. And yet I had to realize that my strength and my power was in my ability to connect with the average person and to connect, help to understand what people are feeling and how to help motivate them through what they're already motivated by. Um, and so I just want you, that's what I'm learning. I want people to remember to bring all of your gear. Don't think that you have to play up some other aspect of who you are and forget another part. Um, and I do believe that when I tried to do that um, throughout my career and try to just kind of, okay, be, be just this, <laughs> this model, you know, um, different type of person, I believe it hindered the things that I could have benefited organizations with. I could have brought my creativity and uh, I could have brought um, just thinking outside of the box. Um, we always say, let's think outside the box. But if everyone is afraid to do that because they're cutting off and they've detached themselves from a part of themselves, then we won't ever really think outside of the box. Um, and so just bring all of your gear. And then I want to say, remember why you're in the arena. Um, I, I cannot stress this part enough. I think we are always much more powerful when we can connect with our, um, I think that's the name of a book, Know Your Why or something like that. First, first Know Why, I can't remember. Somebody knows. Um, but that is so important because I believe that if we ever get caught up in how, you know, where's my next stop and, you know, who knows who I am and, you know, where, where, where next and who needs to respect, you know, my achievements or something like that. 
I think that when we get there and that is our sole focus, we can forget what made us uniquely made for the roles that we're in um, and what made us uniquely qualified, um, what has allowed us to excel in previous roles. And so think about what gave you that passion to pursue whatever you have become successful at. I would recommend that. And that's something that I continue um, to build. Um, it's, you know, one of the things I think about now in the role of um, health director is, okay, you know, all right, I got to make sure I do everything right. I got to make sure that I don't let anybody down and the city down and all the people who sent me those nice messages. I got to, that you know, I, I do everything right for them. Um, I didn't get into this position. I wasn't, I don't believe that my life path brought me here because I'm perfect or because I was perfect or to be perfect for myself or for my image. The reason I'm here is because there is something that I have to offer my community because I'm intimately aware of some of the things that it needs. And so I have to continue to connect with that. I have to continue to go out in the community and talk to people who are having a lived experience. I have to continue to remember those things so that it never becomes about me and the role and the position in the organization. And it is about the people that I'm serving and connecting that with how I'm best suited to serve them. So that, those are my slides. Um, and I, I want to, I'll stop sharing. I, I want to, I know there's a question segment. Um, uh, let's see, stop share. I know y'all say we've been doing Zoom for two years now. I should have it down. <laughs> No, I don't think you have anyone say that here. <laughs> yeah, for some reason, like the system can move differently day to day. I don't know why. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but at any rate, that is what I have for you. Um, the Am I saying I'm an expert on these? No, just gleaning from the things I've learned over the past several years and the things that I use to guide my work. So I hope this would be useful or could be useful to others. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation, Dr. Jones. I am uh, certain that our audience and, you know, those that have joined us today will find it very, very insightful. Um, as we were talking before we started the panel, um, I did kind of, there were several things that you said today that really, really resonated with me. I'm also a huge Brene Brown fan, so absolutely a lot of what you were saying was resonating. Um, and I loved how you put what you know, don't come in or kind of focus on what you know, but really kind of highlighting how much you care and not being afraid to show that in leadership. Um, and I think as women, we often worry because it is that caring and empathetic, empathetic nature that we feel is sometimes held against us, especially when we start emerging as leaders. Um, so I think the question from that would arise is that in uh, what is your particular style of leadership? And how do you feel that being a woman with I'm sorry, Dr. Jamal, you cut out a little bit on the part you said how you said the part about being a woman that and then you cut out, but yeah, I I Paul, let me repeat the question. Yeah. So in um how do you feel that um you know, sort of being a woman and one with your own unique lived experience, how do you feel that that has benefited uh, those around you as well as informed your personal style of leadership? Yes, absolutely. Hi, Dr. Jones, can you hear us? Yes. Did it I cut apologize. 
Yeah, the connection seems to be a little bit unstable. We, um, but yeah, I think we kind of lost you there for a bit. So um, uh, just yeah. awaiting your response. Yes, I'm so sorry. I, I don't know what's going on. Um, I would just say that you, to your question around how do we use it, um, how do how do I use my brand of leadership, um, and what does it mean with my lived experience? I think that the pitfall a lot of leaders fall into is that we forget that the people from all levels of the organization have value and input and that they are integral to our mission, particularly something like what, what a lot of us have, which is a community-based mission. Um, and so we forget that we need to tap into them and tap into what they know and what they believe and their solutions. And so having, being a member of that demographic, so many times that is women of color, black women, mm -hmm. black women, um, we often are in those ranks of an organization. So having that lived experience me to remember what it was like to be overlooked and what it is like to not be heard, but to have these great ideas um, and never knowing how to get them through the ceiling. Um, and so I definitely use that approach, not just with women, with, you know, obviously men as well that I work with, of making sure that they understand I value their input. I value who they are as a person because that's in and of itself is integral to our mission. That's step one. And then I can talk to them about performance and things that I need from the, for them to do. I think starting with that number one is is uniquely what makes us powerful in that space. Yeah, no, thank you. I think um, I yeah, couldn't have put it better myself. I think that that is kind of very, very valuable to keep pulling on those experiences as well. Um, and I, I'm just sort of looking at the chat as well and kind of paying attention to some of the comments that are coming through again. I think people are really liking the analogy with the arena and showing up as your authentic self. Um, also some questions around um, low income and quality housing in KCMO and kind of uh, the gaps that we see from a public health perspective. Uh, so again, just uh, you know, wanted to hear a little bit on your views with regards to what you feel are the greatest public health challenges in the city uh, and uh, how we can use or how you can use uh, your experiences and background um, to really um, meet those challenges. Right. Um, I think I'm, I'm glad someone um, asked that question. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I find in the space we're in, so public health, community health development, um, sometimes I believe we can hyper-focus on programming. We hyper-focus on, I just need to put a program together that teaches people how to um, cook a healthy meal or something mm -hmm. like that. Or I need to put together a program that teaches people how to do X, Y, Z or something, you know, or connects these people with this. And what I um, am learning and I try to encourage people to think about is to think of this all as an ecosystem. The persons or the, the families that are showing up at your um, clinic or, or the health department or wherever, um, they are they have a whole mm -hmm. life, um, a whole environment that um, they bring with them to that space. And so anything that they're dealing with cannot be addressed without dealing with what they're, you know, it can be fully addressed and resolved without addressing the circumstances they're living in. And so I try to remind people, even when it comes to something like violence prevention, which is a huge topic for mm -hmm. our area, as we've seen violence increase locally and nationally. This is not just a Kansas City thing. Anything that we can do around housing and making sure that children stay in school and actually graduate. We know that kids who finish high school mm -hmm. or kids who are not doing well in school, those children are at very high risk for being a victim or a perpetrator of mm -hmm. violence, which tells us as a community, we need to better support our schools. We need to better monitor what's going on in our schools and we should be advocating for what's important there. We think about housing, people who have moved three or more times, those people are at higher risk for dropping out of school. So starting that chain I just talked about where they don't finish school, they're at higher risk of being a victim. So we can't say we care about violence pre prevention mm -hmm. or young people and not be an advocate for affordable housing. We can't do that. Under no circumstances can we say we, we support a single program and not advocate for those things that we know have such a huge mm -hmm. impact on people's lives. Um, and so I, I think we need to continue 
making those connections and broadening our broadening our scope when it mm-hmm. comes to solutions for some of the things um, that are really symptoms um, of our broader issues. Yeah, no, I, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, kind of focusing on the community and then, yes, I absolutely see people in the chat agreeing with you. So definitely, I think people really liked what you said and uh, can relate uh, to kind of those broader issues. And it sort of uh, seems to be a theme with much of what you've touched on, uh, which is really kind of showing up and caring and kind of not focusing on the data as much and then just really focusing on the people who are being impacted. Um, Which again, do you feel that, um, you know, what what do you feel again, and I, hearing you talk, I think I know the answer to this, but would like you to kind of let us know what really motivates you in leadership? What do you find motivating? What inspires you? What keeps you going in this very important work that you do? The last person who asked me that I was on a uh, NPR show and I started mm-hmm. like almost crying. <laughs> so oh. <laughs> I'm going to get me today on that. Um, what keeps me going um, is hope. I do believe um, so many of the things we see um, are because people have lost hope. And so mm-hmm. I know that I can't lose hope. That my I have to make sure that my team does not lose hope and faith in each other, faith in humanity, faith in the community that we serve. Um, that keeps me going, um, just knowing that we have to keep that burning because when that goes, um, things just seem to decline even, even worse. Um, I also have two boys. My husband and I, we have two boys um, and they're almost 10 and seven. And so I think about constantly what is it that I want them, what do I want this community to be like when they're 17, 18, 20 years old? Um, and I don't want it to be a situation where we feel like we have to just move away somewhere else, move somewhere in the city. We'll just live over here. Well, those issues, as we have seen when it has come to COVID-19, mm-hmm. violence, everything follow, everything is everywhere. We're all, because we're all connected. We can't move our way out of so many of these issues. And so I remember that. I remember we the the Ubuntu principle. I am because you are. And however you are, I am also. And so that keeps me knowing, hey, you know, if someone says my fate is entangled with yours. And so I have to make sure that things improve for all of us because for my own survival. Um, And so that is something that keeps me going, but also the sheer brilliance and the sheer potential that I run into around this, um, that keeps me going to just see how passionate people are about their community. Like people love, I've been here 12 years and I think (laughs) I've finally been fully adopted. Um, And I was like, guys, guys, my husband grew up here, his family, does that count? (laughs) Um, But People care about who enters their community, who is doing things in their community, and to, for what purpose. And so people have a really love, a real love and care and concern for Kansas City. And I appreciate that. That keeps me going as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, thank you for that response. Um, very, very powerful, uh, especially with regards to you know, the community and those we serve and being inspired by the people around you. So I wasn't too far off. I had a feeling that you were going to invoke the people around you and um, Mm -hmm. it's good to know that you were kind of on the same page there. Um, Again, I think the other question really, and again, from a woman's perspective, and then again, hearing about your family, I know that a lot of women uh, do sometimes, again, through cultural structures or social expectations or however we want to frame this, uh, do end up feeling like they constantly have to Uh, fight for that balance between that crucial work-life balance, but it's even more nuanced in the case of women where there's that social expectation of prioritizing family, and that if you are passionate about your work, it somehow is taken away from one or the other. Um, So how have you kind of navigated that through the course of your career? Um, And basically, you know, that ultimate question, can women have it all? (laughs) Right. I think the politically acceptable answer is we can have it all, but not at the same time. Mm-hmm. I've heard that before. I don't. I don't know where I fully stand with that that statement. I will say, um, I remember when you know the announcement was made about this position. I remember. I remember people asking, "What is your husband? 
Like multiple mm-hmm. people ask me, what does your husband think? And what does he do? And, and I, it's like, people are trying to calculate now, how does he feel? And is he going to let you do this? And what does he do in order to let you do, you know, it's yeah. just really, really interesting. And I would say that um, having a supportive partner has been probably the single most important thing um, to what I've been able to do. I have a partner who supports me um, he's from day one, from, from grad school day. Hey, I think I want to do a PhD program, <laughs> you know, and all right, do it, you know, um, and we'll make it work. Um, and so I do believe that that is incredibly important. And I believe, and so I believe people who say, well, I don't have that. I don't have that at home. I have so many caregiving duties and we don't share them. Mm-hmm. Equally. Um, I would say that that's not something to just assume is immovable. I would mm-hmm. definitely recommend talk counselor um, and working out how can more balance be achieved, not just so that one person can follow their dreams, but how both of them can be fulfilled. My husband and I, we have very different um goals for achievement in life we have very different passions and so my goal is always to our goal I should say is always to make sure that both people are being met their needs are being met and they may be different at different times Um, and so that is important it should never again going back to it's never about just yourself we are a part of each other we have to work as a team Um, as far as people thinking oh well you can't be passionate about or your, your boys, your poor, what do your boys think about, this? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I'm sure my boys would tell you sometimes, hey, I, you know, why do you have to stay to work till six o'clock or 630? Mm-hmm. Sometimes? Why are you? Um, but for the most part, um, my, my kids understand what I do and why it's important for all of us. And they also, they also recognize that when I am there, I am there. When I'm home, I'm very present. And so I think we have to remember, remember that just as we are multifaceted, you know, we have many different aspects of our personality and ourselves and things we we desire and, and work toward. Um, we can do multiple things at the same time. I think that um, I learn about my work through my boys. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I have been in some ways become a better parent because of the way that I see the community. So I think, again, it, it's kind of showing up with all of your gear. <laughs> Some, yeah. It's showing up with everything you have in, in multiple spaces. Yeah, no, thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and look and see if we have any questions from the Q&A, and there actually is one. Um, so again, really finding the information that you're sharing, very, very informational and uh, wishing you success. I'm kind of looking at some of these comments. Uh, and the question is that what things are you looking forward to in this role and what things do you think you will find challenging? Okay, what I'm looking forward to, I am looking forward to helping um, draw better connections through our community about what public health is. Um, I think even as a as a health department, before COVID, we were kind of seen as the place you go and take your kids to get shots, get their immunizations mm-hmm. for sick in other community, or the place that calls you if you've been, you know, partnered with someone who might have an, a sexually transmitted infection. And um, and then after COVID came about, uh, we're the place that talks about vaccination all the time, and you can go get your COVID shot and your booster. Yes, please come get your booster. <laughs> um, we are doing that. We need you to come get your booster. Um, but we are public health is so much broader than just the absence of being sick at a given moment, mm-hmm. having an active infection. The beautiful part of public health is that we see so many different aspects of our environment as integral to people's health. And so I would like to help the community, you know, even in an active role, get out into the community, get out into nature more for mental health. Mental health is a huge part of what's on everyone's mind right now as we've been kind of buried under cold more than two years. Um, We really want to help people focus again on their mental health and their well-being. Yes, go seek help if you need to, but from a daily maintenance standpoint, we want to be a partner in people's lives um, and show them what kinds of things they can do. Um, What do I think will be challenging? Mm -hmm. Um, I think um, someone always said, so I've talked about the beautiful blessing of public health, the sort of the the curse (laughs) of public Mm -hmm. health is that um, 
it's something where if you're doing your job well, um, people don't know your value. So when, mm -hmm. when you are preventing things, people, you know, don't really, those things didn't happen. And so people don't understand why you're doing what you're doing to prevent them because mm -hmm. they didn't see them. Um, and so that's a challenge, but also going back to something I said about programs, I need people to understand that it has taken us a long, long time to get into the situation that we're in now as our, the, the, the societal ills. It has taken many decades to get there. And so when you implement just a program or one strategy, you will not see results in 365 days or two years or three years. Sometimes there is deep work that needs to happen and it is a phased approach where you won't see the outcomes that you're looking for um, for a few years. And that is very hard to communicate to people sometimes when pe when it may look like, oh, you're not doing anything or what you're doing isn't working. Mm -hmm. Our problems didn't get here overnight and they won't be solved overnight. That's the frustrating part. I'm an impatient person. Mm -hmm. And so I get that. I understand people want fast results. Um, but unfortunately, that is not um, that is not always the, the case. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, patients, so the next question again, the chat, a uh, lot of questions coming in. So a uh, really great question, actually. Uh, they would like for you to talk a bit about how you approach mentorship uh, and advocacy to help women prepare, seek higher level uh, of opportunities. Yes, um, I think that is very important. We're not on mission if we're not doing that. And so my role I see is to, to get to know people and know what their aspirations are. Um, so I've been here um, in this role for about a month now. Um, and my job has been doing as many one-on-ones as I can to find people mm -hmm. who are interested in something else, who have ideas, helping people know that I have an, a listening ear. I think that's the first step. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've made it to the point where uh, people have risen up and said, hey, I want to be officially mentor yet so I do a lot of um what do they call what do they call it um um I forget unstructured mentorship mm -hmm. you know what is it that you want to do how can I find opportunities for you to do those things or learn those things and let me know what barriers are there that you might have so I have a mentee at the high school level and then I have uh so that's always fun um, and then we have, I have a few mentees here uh, at work. So uh, definitely an important task. Absolutely. And again, we're having, you know, some folks are completely agreeing with you and, you know, the comments are coming in. Love that stress on mental health, life stresses. Uh, and again, you kind of struck on, I think, something that uh, is really important, which is that patience piece of it. You know, the problem didn't occur overnight and it's not going to go away overnight. Um, but yeah, another question that came in uh, connected again, I think, to health equity and SDOH concerns is how can you support low income quality housing with the development and gentrification of PCMO? Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I wish I had all the answers to that. Um, I tell you that I don't know. I'm not a, my forte is not housing and development. I will, I will start by saying that. I will say that um, this is something that is important. We need to continue to support quality housing, affordable housing uh, in the urban core. And, and the reason that that is so important is because so many of our wraparound services mm -hmm. are in the urban core, the heart of the city, if you will. And so people do need to be able to access those things easily. Um, we know that people have ties to communities in those areas and from a health perspective, I do worry about people being kind of um, dissipated or, mm -hmm. or distributed throughout an area and leaving that base of support that they had come to know in the heart of the city. And so this is incredibly important. Um, I think it is important to continue to support affordable quality housing. Um, yeah. Okay, no, no, absolutely. I think, um, and a lot of I, what you've kind of mentioned throughout today is kind of really focusing on the community and the people and focusing on um, health equity in general in Kansas City. Um, so I think the other question again, uh, and it will probably, I'm looking through the chat and the Q and A's just to make sure that we're not missing any from the audience. We do want to make sure that they get their questions answered. 
Um, but while we're waiting, I think we're caught up there. Um, Dr. Jones, again, the question, and I'm sort of taking it back into kind of the female uh, arena, especially young women. Um, so what would you tell your 25 year old self? What you know today, where you are today, what, would, what advice would you give your 25 year old self? Mm, that's a good question, uh -huh, Dr. Jamal. Um, I would tell her probably not to be so afraid. Um, and that um, if it feels like you're kind of wandering um, from one thing to the next, okay, why am I here? Why am I at a railroad company? Why do I work here? What am I taking from this? Mm -hmm. Understand that your path has taken you um, in the path that you, in the way that you've gone because will pull from all of those experiences later. I think um, a lot of 25 year olds, even through probably that early mm -hmm. 30s, a lot of people are thinking, where am I supposed to be? And I thought I would be settled by now. I thought I was going to have this by now. I should be more financially sound. I should be um, settled in my career. Um, what, and now I'm just kind of going from one thing to the next. I say, consider all of that time as preparation, all of that time as um, growth. You know, there are some things you're learning about yourself and you're learning about the world. Um, and if you can use that time to learn about yourself and really get to know who you are. So we, we talk a lot about love yourself and accept yourself, but we don't talk as much about know yourself. Mm -hmm. What are your strengths? What are you, what are you uniquely good at? Um, and not like a vocation, but what are your strengths as a person? When you show up in any space, whether you're planning a party or you're going to work, mm -hmm. what do you bring to that? Spend more time, I would say spend more time examining that. Um, and so when you get ready for your big break or your big opportunity, or you get to that place where you feel like you should have been, you'll have so much to pull from. Mm -hmm. um, Follow-up question, Dr. Jones, did you ever imagine starting out back then that um, you would kind of be in the leadership role that you are uh, right now? Um, I can't say that I saw that. Um, and I, and it seems almost weird, like the best answer is like, yes, I always saw that, you know, I wish I could say that, but I did not, um, I didn't see a lot of leaders who look like me, mm -hmm. um, especially of institutions. And so, um, I, I don't know, I don't know if my mind was smaller than, I don't know, but it was, I, I did see myself as doing work that was impactful. That is what I've always seen myself as doing. I want to be in a role where I can have a difference, difference in the lives of the people who are in an organization and externally. And so I, I'm thankful to be in a place where I can do that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that was a great answer. Because uh, I, again, as you mentioned, I think for young women especially, there's so much pressure to have all the answers and to mm -hmm. have them now. Uh, so to just see that, you know, looking back, even with that fear, leaning into it, uh, like you did, and just kind of having that overarching role uh, to look forward to. You did mention something that, that I did want to touch on a little bit, which was parity uh, a little bit in the sense that not really having someone who looked like you. And so we talk a lot about that in healthcare settings as well, uh, mm -hmm. that is there parity in the workforce? Do we look like the people that we serve? Uh, so in your um, estimation, whether it is with regards to having mentors or leaders uh, with that lens of parity, or whether you are someone who is providing some sort of a service to the community, whether in the public health arena or within the healthcare setting, how important do you think that is? And can you speak to the value of that? Yeah, it is incredibly important. Um... <sighs> I think that um, without getting too mm -hmm. <laughs> psychological about it um, or too um, academic about it, people do take cues from their environment. They take cues about who they are, where they fit in a structure and what their value is based off of what they see in an environment. Um, and so I do believe that in spaces, if, if someone is always themselves as, okay, myself and people like me, we're always just showing up to receive service. I just always need a service. Um, and I don't see people who look like me in a position of solutions or help, able to help provide solutions or help um, meet needs. I think that sends a message as well to people and it can add to 
feelings of just hopelessness or despair. Um, I do think that there, there are, we're, you know, I could talk about the benefit of having people who look like you providing as caregivers, mm-hmm. you know, like that, and we've already seen studies about how people who are, um, who receive their health care from someone who looks like them, they tend to have better outcomes. Um, I could also, I think we have just reached the tip of the iceberg with that because I believe there is also huge psychological benefit that we just are not even aware of yet. Um, incredibly important. Absolutely. You know, thank you for sharing that. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go back again. I'm just checking in the Q&A section just to make sure that we, um, you know, are updated on the questions and have answered everything in the chats. Don't really see anything there. So just wanted to kind of confirm. Um, and I know we've had kind of a really in-depth conversation and touched on many, many topics. Um, but Dr. Holmes, again, going back to something and uh, that you did sort of allude to, uh, and that is that question of sometimes women in particular, and I think people of color as well, do tend to feel what we call the imposter syndrome, uh, which is essentially, you know, you have to be the best in the room to get a fraction of the recognition or to um, essentially be taken seriously. That is kind of the impression that we have and that can sometimes lead to the imposter syndrome. Um, Is that something that you've ever felt? Uh, And if you have, how did you navigate it? And what advice would you have for other young emerging uh, female leaders or those who are looking for leadership in their future? Yes, um, I think, transparently and, and, and going back to being vulnerable, I would say I could battle that every day. I mm-hmm. think we battle that there's at least five minutes of every day where I'm freaking out about, no, that wasn't perfect. And that needs to be perfect because it has to reflect me as mm-hmm. being, you know, and I will say that um, anybody on this call who uh, has just some basic mental health knowledge knows mm-hmm. that that will drive you uh, to a place you don't want to be mentally. If we're conti- continuously doing this, this is the way of our lives. We know that it raises cortisol levels with stress levels, the stress hormones in our body. It, it can make us unhealthy. It throws off our metabolism. And I mean, I know you know these things mm-hmm. <laughs> and other, other care providers here know it's not a healthy way to live. And so I would say that um, I know we've been raised like that. Uh, mm-hmm. We've been raised that you have to be five times as good to get a piece of the credit and a piece of the accolades and the the recognition. Um, But I would say that as leaders, it is our job, again, going back to the arena, Mm -hmm. uh, we have to step into the arena and be the first to say, hey guys, I'm not perfect. And I don't want you to think I expect perfection from you. We just all need to be doing the very best that we can. And we need to be reaching out for help where we need it. Um, again, I think that unlocks just so much potential in other people, because when I have to be worried about what you're thinking of me and are you going to use this against me and all of that, mm-hmm. I cannot focus on serving the community the way that you need me to. I'm not focused on people I'm fo- because I'm focused on myself. Uh, and so I really think that is incredibly important to remember that we have to unlearn some of that that we've learned. I am grateful for local city leadership that um, I don't feel the pressure to be perfect I feel like I've been given a range of things to say hey try this if you know and and see how it works and let us know how we can support you and so it's then on me to make sure that I'm promoting that um, with the people in in our organization. Thank you so much Dr. Jones. Um, Again uh, thank you so much for coming today unfortunately I wish that we could go on and on uh, (laughs) with this conversation uh, but we are at time uh, did want to kind of thank you so very much uh, for joining us today, for helping us celebrate uh, Women's History Month through this Lunch and Learn series, uh, and then for also allowing us to celebrate you uh, and the very important work that you've done and to uh, bring your very, very inspiring story uh, to uh, you know, the people who joined us today, as well as uh, hopefully the greater Kansas City Uh, area. We wish you all the best and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Take care. Get your booster shot and also get out in nature. (laughs) 
And on that note, please take your booster shots. I think that is very, very good advice. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Bye now.